The idea of a binary semaphore is if it's just set to true or false, like our example, it's just protecting a single instance of a single resource, okay? Counting semaphores just allow for multiple access to multiple resources. Imagine, for example, a bank of printers. Um, there may be five printers all managed by a single queue. Uh, now, you don't, a, a printer again, is a serially reusable resource. You can't have tasks um, sending, um, um, inter, you know, interleaving characters on a printed page. Um, and uh, now, of course, the way we deal with this is the printer is its own serially reusable interface that simply allows a, um, a non-blocking print command to come in, right? So we send print jobs but they don't interact. No, they don't, I'm sorry, they don't collide. They don't interfere with each other because they're protected by a semaphore. Um, and so a counting semaphore may be, normally we have a named queue is just one single printer. Um, for example, in Kanoi 142, there are two printers, P1 and P2. You could also set it up so that you have a single queue that's monitor that is uh, uh, providing tasks to multiple printers. Generally, these would be copies of the same type of printer. That's when you'd have a counting semaphore so that um, a, uh, a task wanted to send a print job, um, they would just send it to the generic queue. You wouldn't know which of the five printers is being used, but at any time, there's always going to be access unless all five printers are being used at the same time, then you would start blocking. Um, so again, in, in the uh, counting semaphore case, um, if we go back, if we imagine the software flag, again, this is functionally correct. Um, if you can protect the critical, this, the setting, the testing and setting of this flag, um, the uh, idea is the same that tasks would block here if the, it is in use. Instead, with a counting semaphore, they get to jump down to this step um, immediately without blocking until all, in this case, five of the resources are, are used, okay? So that's the difference between a binary semaphore and a counting semaphore. And it's very simple. In both cases, the flag can be an integer. It's just um, what it is, um, just what the initial value is set to, okay? And you can see here that um, what it would normally be for a binary semaphore is we're going to set it to zero, and it's going to go negative when you have to block on it. Same thing happens with a counting semaphore, except we initialize it to max count minus one, as you see right here. Again, we're assuming these are atomic. Um, and so interrupts are set off, uh, are set to off, right? So they're they're uh, uh, blocked. Their 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 uh, flag is set, so you can't uh, cause an interrupt um, to maintain atomicity. But that's just a uh, a short term uh, view until the semaphore is set. Then you no longer have to block um, interrupts. So, but here's what's happened: you do an initialization to max count minus one. So if it's binary, the max count is set, or the uh, the semaphore is set to zero. If it is a counting semaphore of five, we would set it to four. Um, now, uh, what happens is the spin lock is while um, the value of the, while the semaphore is less than zero, then you're waiting. Um, okay, that is the passerin function, okay, um, which is uh, the wait function. And, but it's a multi, uh, this is convention also for naming of semaphores is, is an MP is a counting semaphore because there are multiple weights that, that uh, can be multiple counts uh, before you have to wait. The bottom line is, remember, the passing of the value and the testing of the value is the only thing that has to be atomic or that, pr that guarantees atomicity because once um, the value has been modified, um, you do this modification, then um, the, uh, 
And normally, these are not, spin locks are wasteful ways of creating um, weight blocked tasks. Normally, the operating system is not going to just have it spin. The point of having this tied into the operating system is not only to guarantee atomicity, but it's to suspend the task, basically put the task to sleep so it's no longer in the ready queue, and then resume the task once a resource has been freed up. And so the tasks would be kept in a separate blocked queue, okay? So they're no longer in the on queue, right? They will be now blocked and they'll get moved into a blocked queue and that could also be a prioritized queue, just as we've had before, right? Because keep in mind, these tasks that are blocked still have priorities. They still need to get their jobs done. It's just they're waiting on a critical resource. Um, and so this is the signal or the Verhogen. Um, and again, all it does is in an atomic way, it simply um, increments the, uh, when, when a task releases its uh, use of the semaphore, right? or I'm sorry, its use of the critical resource, then it just increments um, the value. Again, other tasks are going to come in here and they're going to block. Um, by using the uh, weight, they're going to say, oh, nope, I'm going to block until, um, again, a uh, um, one of the resources is freed up. Okay, so again, suspend and resume. Do that instead of spinning, instead of producing the spin lock, um, and so it wouldn't actually do this while it's going to do a if this is set. Um, in other words, if it should be blocking, then I'm just going to put the task to sleep. Okay. Um, now, of course, we mentioned the priority stay in place. But wait a minute. The, the task has been removed from the um, ready queue. Um, and, uh, in fact, the on queue, it's not going to get re, um, started until that part of the critical resource is, um, resolved. Now, this can result in priority inversion. Remember, we talked about before this idea of priority inversion and our rate monotonic scheduling. And we said, yeah, that's kind of a trivial case. It was a, a non-sophisticated case of priority inversion. This is really what we mean by priority inversion, is when a lower priority task can actually preempt a higher priority task. And here's how it can happen. Imagine that we have three tasks, task one, task two, and task three. So those are in priority order. In other words, task one is, has the highest priority, task two is a medium priority, and task three is low priority. Now, um, if they both, if tasks one, the high pri highest priority task, and task three, the lowest priority task, both access the same shared resource, look what can happen, right? Um, that we have task one looks like this. It wants to, when it runs, it uses the shared resource for a fraction of time, okay? Task three, when it use, it also uses the shared resource, but it has this longer task interval, okay? And then task two does not use the shared resource at all, okay? Now, we have properly set up a semaphore to block, to protect the shared resource, so it will only be used serially, one task at a time. Now, imagine if task three goes first. Um, and so task three has started and it is going through this period. Now, it's into the period where it's using the shared resource. In other words, it um, did a wait, and wait determined, the semaphore determined, well, nope, uh, I am not um, busy. I, my resource is available, so I'm going to go ahead and let task three have it. Okay? But then... Task one starts, okay? So task one, remember, it runs for a while, um, but then when it gets to this point here, it wants to use the shared resource. And so task one does a wait, right? But remember, wait says, 
hold on, that task is not available. I'm going to put you to sleep. So it does a suspend. So task one has gone to sleep because it has to wait for the shared resource to become available again. Okay, well, no problem. We're going to restart task three and let task three finish the use of the shared resource. Okay, because as soon as it's done with the, with the shared resource, um, it will re return to the ready queue and the scheduler will see, hey, wait a minute, that's a higher priority task. I can let task three preempt task, I'm sorry, I can let task one, which is blocked on the resource, once it frees up, it can say, oh, okay, let, uh, once I finish using, uh, when task three finishes using the resource, boom, task one will, will be highest priority and ready to go, okay? Now, the problem is, after T1 suspends, T3 restarts, but before it gets through this critical region, T2, which has a higher priority than T3, can preempt T3. It's, that's the proper thing to happen because T2 has a higher priority than task 3. Okay, but what this does is this delays the completion of task 3. Task 1, remember, is still asleep because it never finished using this protected resource. E2 does not need that shared resource. And so um, E2 is happy to run to completion. Then um, it, when, it's, when task 2 is done, the only task on the ready queue is task 3. Remember, task 1 is blocked, so it doesn't appear on the ready queue. It can't run anyway. And so task three will complete its job. Um, and then one, I'm sorry, not, it won't complete its job. It will complete use of the shared resource. Once that shared resource is free, then task one can, release, can preempt task three. Okay, because remember, task one cannot preempt task three as long as task three has the shared resource blocked. You see? And so um, task one preempts task three, preventing it from completing, but allowing it to complete use of the shared resource. Task three will then make use of the resource, but it's still highest priority, so it runs to completion. Now task three can finish. Okay? But let's see what happened, is task one, which is the highest priority task, was actually delayed by the execution of task two. This is what we mean by priority inversion. The task two, a lower priority task, got to execute before task one finished. Okay, effectively then, because task one was blocked by task three, a lower priority task, then this priority inversion can happen. And keep in mind, if this is EDF, if we do this using EDF, this means, this could mean that a, that a task is going to now miss its deadline. What would otherwise be a guaranteed task can miss its deadline. Okay? And this is one of the assumptions that the scheduling algorithms make is that a higher priority task can always preempt a lower priority task. But in this case, that is not happening. The higher priority task is blocked. Okay, and so all bets are off. You won't guarantee that EDF is gonna work. Okay, and that's why priority inversion is such a problem.